episode 163 of the Access Noise podcast. I'm Mark Miller. Thanks for listening. In this episode, I meet Crispian Mills from Kula Shaker to talk about their seventh studio album, Natural Magic. If you missed the previous episode, I spoke to Rick Witter from Shed 7 to talk about their number one album, A Matter of Time. So check it out. And if you like the podcast, please subscribe on your favourite listening platform, give us a rating and leave a comment. Kulishaker released their brand new studio album, Natural Magic. In this interview, Crispian Mills unravels the secrets behind the album, we discuss the Wire TV show, what happened when Crispian gave fans advice, and lots, lots more. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the Access Noise podcast with Crispian Mills from Cooler Shaker. Hi, Crispian. Welcome back to the Access Noise podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. You, it's it's great to talk to you again. Like you said, we've we've chatted quite a bit, haven't we, uh, over the years. It's like uh, wearing an old pair of shoes talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> like, likewise, likewise. But there has been some things that haven't lasted before. So, you know, can you share some of the insights into your early musical influences and how they shaped the formation of Cooler Shaker? It, well, you know, the thing about uh, Cooler Shaker is that the, the, the main kind of uh, magic ingredient is that we all learn to play together. You know, uh, you learn how to play an instrument, but you learn how to play with other people and that's a different kind of experience and you know i learned to play uh, in a band with with alonzo when i was uh 16 that was uh you know that formative those deep formative impressions and then paul i met when i was 18 and jay started playing with him when i was 19 so we really we've kind of um we've kind of got we've got the creases and the impressions are all there from that early time. So we're not just playing music, actually, we're, 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 we're into a, um, we're into a, a dynamic, you know, that, that goes back years. And I think really that's what makes the band pop is that, is that chemistry. Has music always been the career path that you wanted to follow or did you have other ambitions growing up? Um, well, I don't remember wanting to be a fireman. You know, the family business, so to speak, was um, movies and theater. And and, uh, (laughs) my grandmother was a writer and and a playwright. And that really was what I saw all around me. I saw a lot of actors, a few filmmakers, a few producers. My dad was a, was a, was a director and a, and a, and my, his twin brother, my uncle, was a producer and director as well. And um, I tended to see more of the people in front of the camera, actually, the people who uh, were performers. And I, w- it wasn't until later that I started to appreciate how much work was done, you know, by people who, you know, <clears throat> did budgets and uh, were dealing with the cr- also with the craft, you know, of, of, of the technical stuff. Uh, but I did gravitate towards, you know, the idea of being an actor, but everybody in my family was horrified at that idea. I remember because they, because, you know, most actors don't really work much, you know. There's a famous actor called Ken Campbell who <laughs> he was, you'd see him in things like Monty Python and everything. But he's a very respected c- comedy actor and theatre actor. And I do know that at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in one of their, the last lessons, they had Ken Campbell in to do a masterclass and they were all very excited. And he w- walked in with a big cardboard box and plonked it down on the table. And uh, there was a sort of hushed anticipation of what he was going to pull out the box. And he started throwing out balloons. He said, right, we're going to do balloon sculpting today because none of you are ever going to work. <laughs> so you better learn <laughs> some other talent, you know? Um, so it is hard, uh, but when I was 13, 12 or 13, I started playing guitar. I fell in love with the guitar, and that really changed um, my life. Um, and it became a, an obsession and a passion. You know? It's like falling in love, and then you, then that's all, that's all you want to do. 
and I became uh, obsessed and just thought, you know, that's that's that was the only way. Can you remember the first song that you wrote and you thought, right, this is a really good song. I'm on to something here. The first time I wrote a song, uh, yeah, I, I wrote a song when I was about uh, 13 and I did enjoy it. I, I started playing in a band that was trying to get signed. A lot of people were older than me in that band. And there was, and I remember the sense of pressure of what it was to write hits and how, what an awful thing that is to do to anybody, let alone a young, a young musician, you know. And, um, because ultimately nobody, nobody knows what a hit is still. Nobody knows what a hit record is or a hit song. Um, the best description I ever heard of it was the guy, uh, Oh, geez. who was it? it was, I think it was a guy in Procol Harum. Uh, just said, you know, it just grabs you. It's just a piece of music or a lyric. It can be just a lyric that grabs you and it pulls you in and people connect with it. That is a hit. And that comes from, that's an instinctive thing. That's a, that's a, you know, that's like a blessing when that happens. You know, but there is there is a craft to songwriting that you have to learn. Um, you know, they say you know you got to you learn the rules before you can break them, and uh, the best thing you can do as a songwriter is to to just learn lots and lots and lots and lots of songs, learn and understand how how they get built and all the different ways that people have written songs in the past. Yeah. That then you know, like it's like. It's like the Beatles in Hamburg, you know, they just played everybody. They didn't write anything over that time. They just learned how to, they just learned how songs were written by playing them. So um, I, I got, yeah, I remember that pressure really not being good and not being healthy. It took me a while to kind of just break out of that and just write for the love of it. But you mentioned Prokel Harum. I mean, they wrote A Wider Shade Appeal, yeah. which is a brilliant song, yeah. but it doesn't really mean anything, does it? So the, the no, songs don't mean, even need to mean anything, but people love it. it, and it's it great. Yeah, you're exactly right. But it, 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 it communicates something that hits you. Uh, it, it's a feeling in it. And, and because it doesn't mean anything, you invest it with your own meaning. And uh, so it takes you somewhere in your, in your emotional imagination. So absolutely. You know, it's, it, it uh, you know, music, you're dealing with something that's invisible, you know, so it, it is a kind of a, it is a sort of a magical thing to explore and to play. And, and nobody, even the great songwriters still don't really understand what they're doing. I remember my mum meeting John Barry and she was talking, she was very impressed that he was musical. Oh, she said something like that to him. I don't know if they were flirting with each other, but he said, oh, it's just mathematics. Music is just mathematics. And I think he was probably trying to double impress her because she's crap at maths. But, <laughs> um, you know, and it, it is about the, the relationships between notes and all of these sorts of things. But it's beyond that, it's something um, that you just can't really uh, explain. But you also said it's magic. So is that where the, the title came from, from your new album, Natural Magic? Yeah, well, I wrote the song. We wrote the song "Natural Magic," and um, it felt it felt like that was the track that kind of summed up what we were what we were doing, and ultimately what we were about, you know. And it was a writing a song, and Jay coming back from his sort of life in Oasis, and uh, us all being <laughs> reunited. I mean, talk about you know, last weekend. You know, I went I went on tour with Oasis for ten years. Um, and the Gallagher's, I mean, he, 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 it's hysterical. It's hysterical that that happened. And um, and when we all ended up back in the room together, the, the first day we played with Jay, it was one of those kind of cliche moments where you look around the room and you think, oh, my God, we're still here. We're like, no, nothing changed, you know. Just Jay, Jay turned into Gandalf. But apart from that, it all looks pretty like it was 20 years ago. Well, the new album, Natural Magic, it's an absolute banner. It's your seventh record, which follows up 2022's First Congregational Church of Eternal Love and Free Hugs, which was also a tremendous record. 
What inspired you to release another album so soon after that? Because it's probably the closest you'd have released two albums, isn't it? I think it might be. Um, yeah, I think Peasants, Pigs and Astronauts was quite close with K, relatively speaking. But since then, we've got into that pattern of, you know, doing <coughs> a record and then having like three or four years break. And part part of it is we're all, we're all you know, have families and and we were we were had families and we were and I was doing film making films writing films and Alonso it was had a studio in, and he was in Belgium so life had kind of like kind of you know made made things a little bit more complicated in terms of us being able to focus exclusively on the record but um, I think COVID and that whole sort of mania and the experience that everybody had definitely shifted people's sense of priorities. And, you know, a lot of people kind of like got back to like, oh, what's really, you know, um, important to me and who are the people that I really, really connect with? And we all kind of see the world in a similar way. And I actually, (laughs) when, um, when Henry, our last hammer player, who was kind of our, you know, in the in the fifteen years that Jay wasn't with us, he he couldn't do a tour uh, in America, and it and it just kind of like shifted it. There was nobody else that could could do the job. It was just Jay, and Jay just happened to be uh, free and without a gig. And and he'd been through a whole kind of journey as as well, you know, in terms of his life and what he was doing. So when we got together, it, it, it really was another another um, sort of explosion of of life and fun and excitement that, oh, well, wow, you know, got the, the, the original band back together. And we, you just picked up, we picked up where we left off when we were kids, very much so, and it felt that same excitement was there. We did a gig at she- Jebbers Bush Empire in London and, um, it was so it was so exciting, and Jay was playing like a fiend, and it really felt like a new a new beginning. So we just went straight in the studio and started recording. And um, you know, you, there is a certain amount of wanting to capture that lightning in a bottle. You know, let's let's try and get this moment down, and 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 let's you know, I love First Congregational Church of Eternal Love and Free Hugs. But it was it was a double album, and it was more sort of it was very theatrical, and it was, it was quite you know, um, it, it was it was a little bit of a concept album. And with Natural Magic, it was like let's get back to that, like let's write three minute songs and let's just power through and um, <coughs> capture that energy. Yeah, it's certainly more direct album compared to the, the last one um, and the press release you say these songs came about in a very similar way how we recorded our debut album K well because when you're when you're starting off you know you're you're grabbing gigs wherever you can you're very rarely a headline act you know you know because the days of being able to travel around and just play long sets and have an audience you know they 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 fell away in the in the late 70s early 80s and bands have ever, ever since really struggled to have to, to to play to an audience until you have a record out and you're established. So when we when we you know before K, we were always a support band for people who were you know out there and had records to promote, um, or we were playing you know jams in squats and <laughs> Krishna festivals, and so we were always trying you know ultimately we tried to combine you know what. We have to blow people away in half an hour, 35 minutes tops, you know. So you just, you bottle up all of that energy and you get your, your the best songs that you can and you just try and, you know, smash them over the head with it. And so there's something to be said for that approach. And um, and this record kind of has that. It's about condensing what you do and uh, trying to make it really pack a punch in it in a short amount of time. I mean, songs like Indian Record Player, for instance, you know, it's insane. It's like two and a half minutes long and it takes you from <laughs> London to, you know, Calcutta and back again. 
Yeah, it's it's a brilliant track, and the video the video is great fun. You know, I especially enjoyed the video. Um, did you direct <laughs> the video? Yeah, that was yeah, I did. Yeah, that was fun. I mean, that was all you know, f- friends. Uh, I mean, we shot it so quickly, and it's very much on on the cheap. But we did shoot in a real working curry house. So Johnny Kelsey, who plays the waiter, who's a great um, a bungra um, artist and a, a doll play, plays the doll drums. He uh, he agreed foolishly to to <laughs> to be to appear in the video, and um, he said, "Oh, I know you need quite a big space, don't you?" My mate Bippin's got got the you know Bombay Junction in Harrow. He is, you know, he'll let us film there. So Bippin let us. <laughs> In, but he says you've got to be out by six because the customers are going to come in, and it's one of those Indian restaurants that's always full of Indian people because it's it's really good cooking. So you know it's packed. It's absolutely packed on a, like a Tuesday afternoon. They're already coming in, and we were still filming, and we we're all dressed up, and there were saris hanging everywhere and lights, and um, <laughs> so we were still <laughs> filming, and we were running over, and people were coming in, and the food ordering food and beers and um, i think about half past six they turned the lights on and just said out <laughs> it was like being a gig the album title track natural magic it's a real funky number with an amazing groove you know what can you tell me about that track the genesis of it i think um actually what happened with it was a cat I, I had a i was listening to can and i accidentally looped the first 10 seconds of it, of this can track and I can't remember what it was but it it, it looped 10 seconds and then and then, oh and then I looped it up to like 3 seconds 4 seconds and I said so oh, that's a great that's a great groove and actually if you listen back to it now it doesn't quite sound like natural magic but it was a starting point and Paul our drummer he loves can and you know obsesses over it and so, so the the can was the inspiration into into that into that groove, and then we built built the song around that, which was a which is a good way to work. You know, sometimes you start with a lyric or riff, and it was it was cool to start with a bit of kraut rock. The anti war track f bombs. It's brilliant. It's one of my favorite tracks on the album. It's essentially a rap, but I love it. It's a great track, but it's a shame that you still have the right songs about war. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, you know, we we wrote the song "I Don't Want to Pay My Taxes." <laughs> now that that <laughs> it's, it's a shame and, you still have to pay taxes. <laughs> yeah, that is a shame but F, because F bombs is like the sort of um, the appendage. It's like the uh, it's like the uh, it's like the gift shop mm-hmm. as you're leaving. Um, I don't want to pay my taxes. Was my kid picked up a, my kid had been listening to me ranting probably in the kitchen or moaning about the world and my kid who was probably about eight seven or eight at the time picked up a guitar and he went he just went i don't want to pay my taxes i don't want to pay for world war three and i just you know it's like from the mouth of babes you know like talk about <laughs> saying it like it is uh you know because every, everybody the idea of taxes the idea of like contributing to your community I think most people are absolutely down with that. You know, we have a, we have a tradition of compassion, actually. Well, certainly within our communities, but is it really going to the communities? I don't think so. So, <laughs> so yeah. that's really where the song came from. And and um and then and then f bombs was a kind of a joke, like where we play it, like just there's a great um scene in the in the in the TV show The Wire. Uh, one, 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 one of the greatest t- TV shows ever, ever made, ever written. And there's one scene where the, the McNulty, uh, the, uh, I was going to say Prince Charles then, not Prince Charles, Dominic West and the other guy, the black cop, uh, they, they, they're, they're both the two detectives and they go into an apartment and it's, there's been a murder. And the and the the whole the scene lasts about four minutes, and all, every time they find a piece of evidence, they look at each other and they go "fuck," and then they go <laughs> over to another guy, they go "fuck, fuck," and the, it's just "fuck, fuck, fuck" for like <laughs> five minutes. It's a very funny scene, and then we just thought, well, we're going to sing about war. We have to say how many times can we say "fuck" in two and a half minutes? Because there comes a point where 
you're just stating the obvious, so you may as well, you know, have fun with it because a lot it's it's cathartic, you know, and I think music is cathartic, and certainly satire is it's about just letting off steam and you know it's so exhausting you know it's like my tour manager said recently don't watch the news the news gives you cancer everyone knows that (laughs) (laughs) i think uh, i think i think super furry animals hold a record for having fuck uh in a song yeah what was which track was that man don't give a fuck right I think they hold the yeah. record. After refresh, man, that one. I know that um, there was a there was a, uh, an American kind of satirical rapper who did it called "Shit Shit Fuck Stack" or something. <laughs> it's just a <laughs> just a stack of swear words, and and you know when it's when you're not saying it with any kind of venom and you're just letting off steam, it it, it becomes cathartic. It's funny. Mm-hmm. It's interesting you mentioned The Wire. I have attempted to watch The Wire on two different occasions. Um, and I think the, the furthest I get is with halfway through the second season. And I just don't get it. You don't, don't enjoy it. it? No, I just don't get it. It's very slow moving or something. I don't, I don't yeah, know. yeah. Well, funnily enough, see, I I, I first watched it. It would it already run by the time I watched it. I was late to the, late to the show. And um, what happened was um, my kid got born. And I was, uh, this was, uh, yeah, this was 15 years ago, my first boy. And I was definitely in between jobs and I was at home. And uh, because the, the wetting of the baby's head had gone on a long time and um, I had become a bit of a slave to whiskey. <laughs> so there wasn't much I could do really apart from watch TV. And I, I, I just binged. The Wire, and I found two. I found the second season hard going, but what I found was it was the first time I'd watched a show where characters got got unpacked, and you you really got into the layering of a story and the layering of of that of a, of a story world, and and he and it, I actually found like the observations that they, that show made about people and about about society i know it sounds pretty pretentious but (laughs) it was like a great book and and if you read a great book it's it's actually stays with you it's not like a tv show where you turn it off and you forget about it you know it's like really moby dick or something it actually kind of informs your world view and and you take something away that you know there's there's pearls of wisdom there and a and a a little bit more of a sense of what it is to be human and you know you don't really you think maybe a great book you get that but not from a tv show and that was the first time i was like wow that that was a really great show but then i was very very drunk (laughs) (laughs) um, i was more susceptible but i i found like actually by the time i got to season three that was where it where it really where it kind of dawned on me that this was something really special up until that point i was just um killing time i couldn't get off the sofa well you see i haven't been able to get past season two because for the reasons you said so maybe i should get third time lucky give it another go i did have the subtitles on for most of it i will confess (laughs) Because uh, you know the street, the street vernacular is very, very strong, and a lot of it, you know, like there's the kids, you know, like on the corner, you know, you don't understand what they're saying most of the time. So I was watching it with subtitles, <laughs> like it was a foreign movie. Back to the album, the track "Stay with Me Tonight." Who, who's the female vocalist singing with you? Oh, actually, we were looking for um, somebody. At one point, it was going to be Nora Jones and. Nora was sort of humming and ahhing and it didn't happen. And then I called Chrissy Hind and Chrissy Hind was still, oh, I've just done a duet, a bunch of duets. I can't do anymore. So she was like, nah. So um, it didn't, I just, we didn't know who to go to uh, because um, our manager at the time uh, was saying, well, you know, you've never done a duet, you should try it. And so we ended up having two on the record and I was interested to try to do it as a challenge really just to write write a song for two voices i'd never done it so gave it a go and um and naturally it was a it was a 
a, a, a very lovely singer who was just around the corner from the studio where we were working, working at the Leveller studio uh, in Brighton. And, um, and I had, I had actually just uh, heard her play at like an open mic about 10 years before when I was with a band called the Jeevas. And I just remembered all oh, that girl with that really lovely soul voice. Uh, and uh, she's a mum now. She wasn't, she was a girl then. Anyway, she came in and she just, she just, you know, with a duet, it's about, you've got to feel that there's a chemistry. You've got to hear a chemistry. So it's not just about whether someone's a good singer. It's whether the voices actually kind of communicate and, and, and work well together. And so we, we, we got lucky in the end with Al. Al's her name. And she has, she runs a choir as well nearby. So, um, so she's, you know, she's got soul. The track Give Me Tomorrow, it's a great way to end the album. You know, listening to it, it's like be, take it, being taken back in a time machine to the 1950s. When you were writing that song, did, did you have uh, did you have that song and, and the sound right from the start? You know, the sort of 50s vibe? Yes, I did. I did. And I wrote that song uh, and, and that was sitting around in the dro- bottom drawer for quite a long time. I remember I um, made the demo and I just went for it. I think I did it about four years ago and I, I made the demo and it, the demo was so old fashioned and so romantic. And, and I started to become sort of self-conscious. And there's a little bit of Tales of the Unexpected about it as well. Da, 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 da. And I, was, um, I like that. But then I started, it started to feel so romantic. I started to sort of become self-conscious and I, didn't play it to anyone for a long time. And then I sent the demo to Alonzo and he was like, no, oh, that's a real, I love that song. And I was like, give me it. It's like, it's give me tomorrow, but it's also give me a break. You know, give me, give me, give me some of that old romance. You know, like people don't write songs like this anymore. And I wasn't sure whether that was a compliment. Um, but when we came to record it, you know, the, the, the putting the strings on and, and then, you know, the sort of George Harrison slide. Uh, and also, it, it, it's also that kind of David Lynch, 1950s kind of, you know, psychedelic kind of country slide guitar. So it had all, a lot of ingredients that we, that we liked. But, you know, when, that's what, what we often do with recording is, you know, you try to sort of create a, a space. And, and, you know, something I realized when I was, when I was working on film is a, a lot of a lot of the records that are made in the past is there's, there's a lot of frustrated filmmaking going on <laughs> because <laughs> you're, you're trying to create a scene and a world and a story and and you're trying to make I've always tried to make visual music music that gives you sort of colors and pictures and and so um we've we've always now we're more conscious that we're doing it so now let's we're going to create a space you know in an old theater um you know at the end of the pier and we're going to take everybody off you know on a, on a memory or something but even when you're putting the run in order together of an album do you, do you see it like a movie with a beginning middle and the end yeah ab- absolutely i always you know we're hanging hanging in there resisting the the uh the sort of the tyranny of the playlist which is now you know the way that people listen to music and obviously so many great records feel like stories and feel like books and and have a beginning and a middle and end but actually you know my um my kid my 15 year old kid my oldest one i i i i went into his room the other day and i heard some music playing you got very eclectic tastes, you know. But uh, one one of the things was he was listening to some music and uh, said, uh, "I said, what's this?" He went, "Oh, I'm listening to American Beauty by the Grateful Dead." I said, "Oh, what what track is this?" He went, oh, "I'm just listening to the whole album. I got tired of playlists. <laughs> 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 I just wanted to listen to like one thing and just you know get, get that experience." And I. And it, it was really encouraging because I think actually it, the playlist, the, the streaming thing is, it, it's not all bad because, you know, you get recommendations and you're, you're listening um, 
uh, uh, experience does open up and you are exposed to different types of algorithms, I mean, albums. And, um, and then it comes a point where if you really like music, if you're a music fan, you can just settle down and explore, you know, a style or, a, or an artist and an album and, you know, like my kid did. So I, I was really encouraged that for people who want that, you know, you should, you should still, you should still, uh, you know, have faith that they'll listen, <laughs> that they're still going to care. Well, artists and bands have a love-hate relationship with streaming services such as Spotify for obvious reasons. So, so you're happy enough with your music being on it? Yeah, I am now. Uh, I mean, if in terms of money, you know, I hate it. But in terms of how easy it is to access music and how easy it is to just say, oh, you've never heard that track here, boom, and there it is, you know, and be the way you can share music is just, you know, really, really amazing, actually. But in terms of like musicians being able to do what they do and get paid, it's just shocking. It is shocking. I know a friend of mine, I won't say who is, is in a band. Um, and uh, he got, he got some great news <laughs> that, you know, like he'd had, you know, a million streams or something. And, and uh, he was like, whoopee, you know, that's great. That's all kicked off. And then, and then he got a bill for the, um, for the promotion and the promote, he got a check for four grand and then a bill for five grand for the promotion, online promotion. <laughs> so he was, he was a grand out of pocket, you know, so you got to just hope that people come and see you live because, you know, streaming isn't going to work. That we're, we're in terms of fans, you know, when you make a record, you're really thinking about the record itself. You're thinking about the vinyl, your, the, the cassette, the, the package of people who are, who really uh, want something to take home with them of, of value. That that's really what you're making your record for. And um, streams are like this, the bonus. You know, they're like the introduction. They're like the date. You know, yeah. From a from a fan's point of view. It is great because again, I can check out your album. Go, I really like that, and then I'll buy the physical version, whether it's CD or or uh, the the vinyl, and I always do. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm I'm you know I've still going. If I see a record store, I still pop by and buy something. Yeah, mm-hmm. addicted. My kids are addicted too, so uh, you know that's 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 uh, encouraging. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So was mine actually. Um, Will you be touring the new album in the new year? There's going to be a tour announced uh, soon, actually, in the UK. Yeah, so um, that that will be uh, probably in the spring, and um, we're uh, we're going to go through an, a, another cycle. But I, I think we're going to be doing things a little bit differently in terms of um, you know just just keeping the experience fr- fresh for us as well as for people who want to come and see us play but really Kula Shaker has always been um about the live shows I mean it, it, that that's that's really where where it all happens and um you know it's not it, it, it's not just about the band and it's in the songs it's all it's all about that like you know the uh the congregation and, and uh that's why that album the last the, the last double album was, it was really all about you know, the kind of everyone, the coming together, you know, and that's, that's the exciting part of being in a band. How important is it to you to be making new music and not just going out there and going through the motions and playing the greatest hits, but actually staying active as musicians creatively as well, you know, and being out and performing? I think it's really important if it's good, if you're, if you feel like you're writing good stuff, if you feel like you're still evolving and, 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 and beating what you did before, you know, uh i have seen older bands who have have done great gigs playing the old songs and it still felt exciting but personally for me you know the the thrill is 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 cre- creating and seeing seeing new things happening i mean i'm still i'm still excited by the world and uh i'm still you know you know, happy to be alive. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've still got something to sing about, you know. 
if people want to understand your music, what are the five songs they should listen to? That's a good question. I'm going to come up with some random examples, which I actually won't be able to back up. But, um, <laughs> well, obviously, uh, Govinda and Tapper, um, you know, that, that, that those are kind of, uh, those, those songs uh, really were kind of game changers for us because uh, I almost said Gay Chambers there. I don't know why Gay, <laughs> gay Chambers the producer, I think. Um, but uh, Tapa, Tapa was the song that kind of shifted us and got us a, a, a recognized it within the industry, got us a record deal, and then ultimately kind of broke us through with the with a with a, a the, you know broader public, and Govinda was the song that kind of was the first song that we played as a band that kind of we started playing it at every show and it became um, you know very very sort of important part of who we were and and it was our, like our sort of magical moment in the set that even if we were playing in a pub to nobody and we played Govinda like the pub would be transformed. It was not just a pub anymore. It was a place where a happening was taking place. So, um, uh, and then we, well, there's a song on the second album called Great Hosanna, which is a very sort of idealistic, slightly sort of, um, I, I know, theatrical, uh, sort of ode to the future and the 21st century as, as it was approaching. And then, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm just randomly going to start picking through. I mean, you know, I love uh, Ophelia is a great, uh, is a beautiful song on Pilgrim's Progress, one of Alonso's songs uh, that he, you know, it's very, very romantic. I mean, we we are a bunch of sort of, uh, you know, hippies, basically, romantic hippies at heart. And um, Ophelia is, you know, w- 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 one of my favourite songs that we ever recorded. You know, and it, and it even sort of pulls out lines from Tennyson and Shakespeare. <laughs> it takes balls to do that, all right. Um, so what am I? I'm up for now, aren't I? Sure. So, oh dear. Well, you know, I have to say, natural magic. You know, that's that's the that's the other one that I would say that brings it all up to date, and and it, um, it it's an expression of our sort of the kind of energy that we. That we uh, that we're plugged into. I'm reminded of a poem that Rick Mail wrote in the Young Ones book, and it's like a love poem to Felicity Kendall, the actress. It says, oh, "Felicity, Felicity, you fill me with electricity." <laughs> <laughs> and then the last, next line is like sticking your knob in a light socket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what a legend! We'll miss him. We'll miss Rick. Yeah, well, you know. Um, the, 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 you know, like the Marx Brothers and the Young Ones, that that kind of a- a- anarchy that has a, a sort of satire to it, 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 it's very, very rock and roll, actually. And we, I mean, people who, who know the band well understand that, you know, we we love all that stuff. And that's like to, that's also been a, a massive influence and that we're actually quite sort of badly behaved bunch. And um, we, you know, so, songs like I'm Against It, you know, uh, uh, have that kind of spirit. And uh, we love, you know, real rock and roll. I mean, you know, God bless uh, Liam and, 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 and his antics, but I never really felt that Oasis was like really rock and roll. I, I thought, you know, that there was some good songwriting and obviously it was it was a good time for guitar music and they, they, they really helped other guitar bands as well, um, just like Nirvana had really helped, you know, guitar bands. But it wasn't really rock and roll for me. Like Rock and roll is the young ones. Rock and roll is <laughs> Jerry Lee Lewis. It's the Marx Brothers. It's the kind of anarchy that it's not really political anarchy. It's just this freedom of spirit that you know will not be put in a box it will not go quietly into you know uh you know conformity and you it keeps you thinking independently and that um, that's really what it's about for me although i would say it's debatable that the the song that the young ones did with cliff richard (laughs) would be rock and roll (laughs) Yeah, yeah well i was a kid i bought that I bought that. And my brother bought it as well, and we lived in the same house, so it was all about 
we were, I don't know whether we were really supporting comic relief as much as we just wanted to see the young ones at, at number one on top of the pop. <laughs> Kula Shaker has a dedicated fan base. What's the most unique or surprising encounter you've had with a fan? Unique or surprising? Well, um, there's been a couple, but one one that springs to mind was there were two very lovely girls from, I think they were from Denmark. They may have been from Sweden. This story is not going where you think it's going, by the way. They, they were two lovely girls. This was this was back in back in the day, in I'd say probably 1998. And they were at a gig. It was either Stockholm or Copenhagen, and Copenhagen. And they said, "We want to go to India. Well, can you recommend anywhere?" And I said, "Oh yeah, sure. You want to go to India? Oh, well, let's uh, have a great adventure. Why don't you try look at these places?" Da 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 da. And I just kind of listed off a few places that that they may find uh, uh, you know uh, illuminating and uh, exciting. And I said, "Oh, and there's a family here that I know. And if you go to this town." And you knock on their door, they'll feed you and they'll, they'll, they'll tell you, you know, they'll help you find somewhere to stay. And they'll be the, your hosts are very lovely people. I could tell they were nice girls. And I never, I never thought of them again, really, uh, until, <laughs> until about seven or eight months later. And I was in India and I was on like some sort of medieval pilgrimage and I was walking around some holy place barefoot and, and having my own sort of weird experience. And, uh, and my 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 wife my wife at the t- um, at the time my aunt she's still my wife she was ill with malaria and it was quite I, I would say a shit show <laughs> <laughs> and, and I went to see this family that I recommended and the, I just walked into the room and these two girls were there and they looked like they lost about you know two stone uh, each. And emaciated and slightly sort of in shock with a sort of thousand yard stare. And I said, uh, oh, oh, hello. <laughs> I mean, are you okay? And they said, oh, you know, we went to, we got lost in the jungle and caught in a monsoon and we nearly died. And our parents thought we were dead and the Red Cross were looking for us. And they were, there were even a news story on the television in, uh, back in their home country said these two girls that were missing in India feared dead. <laughs> <laughs> and it was all because I'd sent them off to have a life-changing experience in India. But it did change their lives. It really did. And um, all I could say is that um, I hope they look back fondly on it now. And um, that was certainly a, a surprising fan encounter. Um, so I think you need to be really prepared you go to India, you know. Don't go wandering through the jungle in a monsoon. I like to ask my guests the following questions. If you could go back and relive one musical moment from your career, what would it be? Um, it's a very hard uh, question. I, I've, I'm very, I'm lucky uh, to say uh, that uh, I've had quite a few moments where you stop and w- want to pinch yourself. And um, I honestly can't pick one, but I can list a few moments that I still look back on with amazement. I know that Paul, our drummer, Paul, was playing with some other bands. Now he he's still very active. You know, he even when we're playing, he'll go off and do other gigs. He just he lives to play. He'll play with anyone. You know, he just uh, obsessive. And uh, but he he said he was talking to some younger musicians about some stuff, and they were asking him questions about uh, you know playing Glastonbury or whatever, or, or recording and. You know, and he would tell them stories and he would say, oh, on a minute, did I make this up? Like, even <laughs> he couldn't quite believe it was real. You know, um, recording on uh, Pink Floyd's uh, houseboat, uh, headlining Glastonbury twice on the same weekend. Uh, you know, uh, that was a sort of twist of fate. You know, um, Nebworth, the Top of the Pops, songwriting with Donovan on Hash Cakes. I mean, I have had amazing adventures, and and what, like I said, you know, what what was encouraging is like we're still having our, these adventures now. You know, that gig at Shepherd's Bush when Jay came back at the end of 2022 was like it was just completely uh, incredible experience that you know we 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 were just uh, you know kind of 
still that energy was there and it, it it felt like a really special night so you know it's the people you're with really that make it special you know if i'd been with a bunch of arseholes uh, i really wouldn't have fond memories but you know even when things go wrong if you're with your with your mates you know you make each other laugh and um you know it you, you, you sh- you've got that bond what's left on the musical bucket list for coolest here a musical um <laughs> could we shake of the musical that would be yes, great we're talking, we're talking to ben elton now <laughs> <laughs> no yeah you're quite right to ask the question and 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 i think you do have to keep keep asking yourself that question um uh, but uh not you know not with any anxiety but we're going to keep uh got to keep yourself um re- reinventing and and having new new experiences and it goes with it goes with anything doesn't it you got with your life you know new skills new challenges i'm not i'm I'm not learning to ride a unicycle or anything but you know what i mean (laughs) (laughs) well it's good that they see that the band's back re-energized with great new music you know natural magic is fantastic you know it's a direct album completely different you know that's the thing you know, you develop and, 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 and sort of reinvent yourselves with each record, and you've definitely done it with this one. I've really enjoyed it. Oh, thanks. Thanks so much. It's great. You're the first person, actually, that um, we've spoken to about it. So this is the first interview of this next sort of cycle, and first person we've spoken to who've heard, who's heard the whole album. So uh, that's great to hear. And, um, you know, yeah, I, I love I love albums being different like I love when band, art bands and artists have very different albums that uh, represent a, a different sort of period in their in a chapter in their life and have you know it's the same band but it's it's a different kind of vibe and so uh, you know we we went for that on this one too. Yeah, there's rock, there's Indian music, there's doo wop, you know, there's rap, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's duets, there's just. Lots to unpick and, and hear. It's brilliant. Thank you. Great. Well, um, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Likewise. Is there anything else you would like to mention before we wrap up? Anything coming up in the immediate future, Crispin? No, I'd just like to apologize for talking so much. The coffee that, the coffee just kicked in halfway through. Well, listen, it's, it's great to, to speak to you again, as always. Um, real pleasure. Okay, yes. Uh, love and peace. Cheerio. <laughs>